Hi there, I'm Wayne O'Neill. Um, I'll just share my screen and then I'll get our presentation underway. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen now. So the title of our presentation that Miguel gave to us is Fusarium Wilt's 146 year history and epidemiology. Okay, firstly, I'd like to thank Ken for his more than generous introduction and also the masterclass organizers and CGIAR ProMusa for the opportunity to present today. Before I start, I'd like to pay tribute to Ken and mention some of his career highlights. Ken commenced work as a cadet for our department in 1956, and he had a distinguished career as a plant pathologist, working tirelessly in horticultural research for 45 years. Among Ken's many career highlights was the development of a successful strategy to manage bacterial wilted ginger, and also groundbreaking work to manage Phytophthora diseases of avocado and pineapple. Of course, Ken was also a world leader in research on Panama disease, and that is how most of you would know him. Ken led major, major international research projects on the diversity and distribution of the pathogen worldwide and amassed a huge culture collection of isolates, which has proven invaluable to continuing research on the diversity of the pathogen and also the development of diagnostic tools. He also led work screening Musa germplasm collections against the pathogen at race one and subtropical race four infested sites. Uh, and this work led to the re commercial release of the resistant fear one variety as Goldfinger in Australia. In 1997, he was given an award of honour for service to the Australian banana industry. And in 1998, he received the Pisang Raja Award from INIBAT, which was international recognition for his research on Panama disease. Ken was made a fellow of the Australasian Plant Pathology Society in 1994. Now, although he supposedly retired in 2001, Ken has continued working as an emeritus scientist and generously helps with mentoring young, younger scientists as well as turning his mind to new plant disease problems. Lately, as he mentioned, he's devoted much of his time to researching the emerging issue of dieback disease in our magnificent Bunyapine Araucaria forests. Of course, we were very lucky that he was prepared to be involved when TR4 was first detected in Queensland, as his depth of knowledge and practical experience with Panama disease was absolutely invaluable to formulating our response. And I don't think it would have been nearly as successful without Ken. Okay, the presentation will be largely based on our review paper, uh, The Epidemi Epidemiology of Fusarium Wilted Banana. Uh, it's by Ken, Lindy Coates, myself, and David Turner. Ken and Lindy especially did a great job of distilling many decades of work on banana fusarium wilt into one well-referenced document. The epidemiology information presented in this talk and our paper is generalised, but should be broadly applicable to all strains of the pathogen. There was a golden age of research on Panama disease by government workers and also funded by the fruit companies from the 1920s through to the 1960s. People like Brandes, Wardlaw, Risbeth and Stover, among many others, did some amazing work with the limited technologies that were available at the time. Research on the disease then declined dramatically with the introduction of Cavendish, as it was largely thought that the problem was conquered until the emergence of TR4 epidemics which have again brought Panama disease research to the fore. Ken has delved through all of that old literature, which contains a lot of fundamental knowledge of Panama epidemiology and summarized much of it in our paper. Now this foundation knowledge is being supplemented with exciting new research to give us a better understanding of the disease and hopefully to come up with some new solutions for its control. Okay, so here's a brief outline of the content of this presentation. Uh, before we get into the epidemiology of the disease, we'll go through uh, some history of Panama disease, and then we'll cover areas like the life cycle, symptoms, the influence of climate and soil, pathogen and disease spread, pathogen survival, epidemic models, some case studies, and finally, just a little on control and containment of the TR4, TR4 incursion here in Queensland. Of course, the history of Panama disease goes back much further than 146 years, which is mentioned in the title of the presentation. But that number references the first scientific description of the disease. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, FOC co-evolved with its Musa hosts in the center of origin in Southern and Southeast Asia. 
Diverse cropping in traditional farming systems likely minimised the impacts of the, the, the disease, which became more apparent when susceptible bananas were cultivated more intensively in the presence of the pathogen. Strains of the pathogen which arose in discrete locations would have been spread just locally at first, then island to island and eventually around the world, largely in asymptomatic but infected or infested planting material. Some strains became very widespread around the world, for example, BCGs 0120, 01245, and now uh, 0121316, whereas others were left behind in the centre of origin and are still only found there. Okay, so on to the first scientific report. Uh, Dr. Joseph Bancroft was a surgeon, a pharmacologist, and a parasitologist born in England who emigrated to Australia in 1864. He made several significant medical discoveries, uh, especially his investigations on leprosy and the mosquito-borne parasitic disease, Valeria. And he also developed an interest in botany and agriculture. In 1874, he described the symptoms of Panama disease and made some very insightful observations. He described the external symptoms, the internal vascular discoloration, and following some microscopic examination, he determined that the causal agent was a fungus. He noted that the disease was affecting the AAB sugar variety, also known as silk, but not Cavendish. He also realised that the disease was being moved with infected planting material and made the very insightful comment that intending planters of bananas would do wisely by making selections from sources free from the disease. So in this very first published report of the disease, Bancroft has worked out that it's caused by a fungus, noticed noted that there were differences in host resistance, and we now know he was looking at race one. And he also advised that clean planting material should be used to avoid spreading the pathogen. Okay, moving on to some subsequent uh, pathology milestones. In 1910, Smith was the first to isolate the fungus from infected banana material. He recognised that it belonged to the genus Fusarium and named it Fusarium cubensi because his samples had originated from Cuba. In 1919, Brandis completed Cox postulates and so demonstrated that the fungus was indeed the cause of the disease. Vollenweber and Reinking recognised that the pathogen was a variant of the existing species, Fusarium oxysporum, so it was renamed by them in 1935. And in 1940, Snyder and Hansen devised the concept of specialised forms or formae specialis to categorise the various types of host-specific Fusarium wilt. So the name was changed to Fusarium oxysporum forma specialis cubensi. The pathogen has remained as FOC until recent revisions, but is comprised of many distinct clonal strains, which vary in their pathogenicity to different MUSA hosts. Of course, the common name Panama disease arose from the epidemics in Central and South America. FOC was moved to the region by the Portuguese and Spanish with planting material. Disease outbreaks in the Gros Michel variety began in Panama and Costa Rica in the 1890s. Vast plantings like the one shown in the picture on the left in Costa Rica were devastated, and you can see the aftermath of an outbreak in the picture on the right. In total, more than 40,000 hectares would be destroyed by the disease, causing collapse of some export markets until Cavendish was introduced to replace Gros Michel. From 1900 to 1930, the disease spread through other countries like Honduras, Guatemala, Colombia, Suriname, and Jamaica. And by 1925, FOC was established in most banana growing countries in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the picture in this slide is actually of the valley where I live. Uh, and here had been divided into small holdings for returned soldiers after the First World War. Uh, the land was cleared and planted to bananas, but by the late 1920s, uh, the bananas were abandoned due to Panama disease and the bunchy top virus. Okay, so the industry responded when areas became too heavily infested to replant by continuing to clear more land for the expansion of banana plantings. The majority of the best well-drained alluvial soils were heavily infested and could not be replanted with Grove Michelle. So virgin forested land was cleared, as you can see in the pictures, uh, for farming until eventually suitable sites became increasingly rare. This availability of new land had the effect of delaying the deployment of the resistant Cavendish banana 
as Gross Michel was still the favoured cultivar for export markets. Some attempts were made to control the disease, uh, including techniques such as flood fallowing, which you can see in the picture on the left there. Um, this was used in areas where production occurred on alluvial floodplains and flooding was possible. Such control measures had um, some but limited success, and eventually the writing was on the wall for Grace Michelle when control measures weren't sufficiently effective and uninfested land was in short supply. Despite the expense associated with the change in cultivar, the banana companies transitioned to Cavendish in the early 1960s. So the Gross Michelle epidemics in Central America are typically thought of as having been caused by race one of the, the disease. However, Stover in his work described both odoratum and inodoratum isolates in these locations. Odoratum isolates produce volatile organic compounds when grown on starch substrates such as pasteurised rice and in general these are considered race 4 isolates. From more recent studies we know that the odoratum VCGs 0120 and 0126 were among the strains that caused the Central American epidemic. VCG 0120 is known as a subtropical race 4 strain that causes disease in Cavendish in countries like Australia, South Africa and the Canary Islands. So strains which are considered race 4 in some parts of the world have actually been present in Central America for many, many years. But of course they were behaving as race 1 towards Cavendish in that region because of the climatic conditions. This illustrates the inadequacies of the traditional race structure when applied to FOC. The pathogen is very diverse and banana by VCG by location interactions are all somewhat unique. So a rigid race structure is really not appropriate for FOC, although it's still conven convenient to talk in terms of simplified races in some circumstances. Uh, in Australia, cases of Fusarium wilting Cavendish had been observed since the 1950s, and these cases increased in frequency and severity until race 4 strains were characterised in the 1980s. It became known as subtropical race 4 because the suboptimal growing conditions at such latitudes predispose Cavendish to infection, and such conditions are required for disease to occur. Subtropical race 4 was introduced to South Africa, possibly via Australia, and it also causes disease in Cavendish there, as well as in other locations I've mentioned, like the Canary Islands. The same strain responsible for the majority of these subtropical race worldwide probably originated in Java and is still commonly found there and in other parts of Southeast Asia and, of course, Central America, as just mentioned. However, wilt in Cavendish in the tropics had rarely been recorded prior to the first TR4 epidemics and was usually related to predisposing conditions such as acidified soils and waterlogging. So now moving on to TR4. Tropical race 4 is sometimes described as a new strain, but like most other strains of the pathogen, it's prob probably been present in the centre of origin for a very long time. It likely originated in the region of Sumatra and Peninsular Malaysia, uh, and these two areas have been connected by a land bridge in the past at times of lower sea levels. And it can still be found in those locations, those locations on giant uh, Cavendish cultivars. VCG0121, which is very similar genetically, is also found in the same location. Uh, Fusarium wilt had been observed in Taiwan since 1967. It was designated as race 4 in the 1970s, but was assumed to be the same as the subtropical wilt in Australia and South Africa, despite much of the banana growing area in Taiwan actually being in the tropics. It was only in 1989-90 that it was realised that different strains were causing the disease. Uh, both VCG 0121316 and 0121 occur in Taiwan, and they're likely to have been moved there in planting material from Sumatra or Malaysia. In the early 1990s, export Cavendish plantations were established in Malaysia, Sumatra, eastern Java, and on the island of Halmahera. TR4 infections became apparent soon after establishment and the plantations were soon abandoned. You can see some uh, symptoms from a plantation there in a photo by Natalie Moore. Although tissue culture plants have been used for planting material, the possibility of endemic strains capable of attacking Cavendish hadn't really been considered. Clean planting material was contaminated with unpasteurised potting soil, and the pathogen was quickly spread through contaminated irrigation water in some plantations. Despite this major wake-up call to banana producers, 
TR4 continued to spread and was next, next detected in China in the mid-1990s, the Northern Territory of Australia in 1997, and the Philippines in the mid-2000s. As well as continuing its spread through Southeast Asia, TR4 was detected in the Middle East and on the African continent in Mozambique in 2013. In 2015, it appeared in the main production area in Australia, in North Queensland, as well as in Pakistan. In the years since then, it's been confirmed in more Middle Eastern and Southeast Asian countries, as well as in India. The Americas were, of course, the last major growing region to be free from the pathogen until the first report in Colombia in 2019. Okay, so just a little brief background on the uh, North Queensland incursion. I received a phone call from a North Queensland pathologist in February 2015, and I could immediately tell from the tone of their voice that they were concerned. Some Cavendish plants had been sampled from a suspected case of bacterial rhizome rot, but Fusarium oxysporum was also consistently isolated. The symptoms were not entirely typical of Panama disease because the plants had that extensive soft rot and minimal vascular discoloration. Once we received the isolates, TR4 was quickly diagnosed by PCR and secondary confirmation was provided some weeks later by VCG testing. However, it just goes to show that the disease may not always present in a typical fashion when it first arrives in a new area and can, can potentially be overlooked for a period and so valuable time for containment may be lost. Complacency towards varieties other than Cavendish can also be a problem. If other strains of Panama disease are present in a given area, it's easy to assume that they're responsible for disease symptoms. So it's important to be vigilant with diagnostics for early detection of TR4. It can first appear in a new area in a variety other than Cavendish. Okay, so that concludes the history component of the presentation. So now I'll move on to epidemiology. Uh, FOC, of course, is a soil-borne fungus with strictly asexual reproduction. It produces microconidia, macroconidia, and chlamydospores as survival structures. And you can see examples of those uh, in this slide, as well as the culture plate. Uh, Fusarium multibanana is a typical vascular wilt disease. The pathogen is considered to be a hemibiotroph, since the initial infection establishes a biotrophic relationship with the host, but it eventually transitions to a ne necrotroph where host tissue is killed. Multiple cycles of infection occur in a banana plantation that's infested with FOC. So if we have a look at the life cycle diagram that's in this slide, um, and we can start with the healthy banana stool on the right hand side, the process begins with the introduction of the pathogen to a disease free location. Clematospores germinate in response to root exudates and following contact with a root surface, the fungus starts to colonise cortical cells intercellularly. The fungus then moves into the root system, oh sorry, the root xylem, and progresses through the system to the rhizome and pseudostem via hyphal growth and the transport of canidia. The fungal mycelium, along with gums and tyloses produced by the plant as a defence mechanism, block the xylem. This blockage, in combination with toxins, leads to chlorosis, water stress and wilting, so we're right on the left hand side now. Eventually the vascular system is extensively colonised and the fungus then invades parenchymal and cortical tissues, producing abundant chlamydospores. Chlamydospores and short-lived short -lived micro and macro canidia are released from decaying plant material into the soil. The fungus can then survive for many years as dormant chlamydospores, as a saprophyte of senescent plant material or as an endophyte or parasite on asymptomatic weed and grass hosts, ready for the cycle to start again. Okay, so looking at symptoms, external symptoms of Panama disease resemble those of drought and include wilting, chlorosis and necrosis of leaves. Stem splitting may also occur. Um, you can see that in the, the centre photograph there. The internal infection and host response causes internal symptoms characterised by reddish brown discoloration of the vascular tissue, which can, can extend from infected roots through the corm into the leaf bases that comprise the pseudostem and right up into the leaves and the bunch stool. The cause of symptoms was traditionally explained by two theories. Uh, the toxin theory, that the symptoms are caused by fusoric acid and other phytotoxins, or the plugging theory, that the symptoms are caused by hydraulic failure of xylem due to the plugging of the vessels. 
the uptake of water and nutrients are impeded and symptoms will be more severe if exposed to environmental stress. In reality, a combination of these two factors contribute to symptom expression. And recent work, for example, by Lee in 2013, has shown that toxins like fusuric acid and also bavericin appear to play a much more important role in the pathogenic process than previously recognised. As mentioned, the infection can move right through the banana plant as far as the peduncle or bunch stalk. Uh, in the picture there, you can see a few um, spots of vascular discoloration uh, in the peduncle. Uh, bunch stalks from packing shed should be dealt with responsibly in areas where fusarium wilt occurs as they pose a risk for disease spread. To date, there's been no evidence of the fungus moving into fruit. Uh, years ago, Ken undertook extensive rounds of isolation from fruit of diseased plants and couldn't isolate the fungus. Walduck and Daly investigated plants with, invest with infection extending into the bunch stalk in the Northern Territory of Australia. In a few cases, they also observed symptoms of invasion in the cushion or crown area of the hand and were able to isolate the fungus from that tissue. However, symptoms extending through the cushion and into the pedicel were never observed and iso isolations from the pedicel and from the fruit skin and pulp indicated that the fun that fungal inv invasion did not occur. Severely diseased plants uh, likely to have infection in the bunk bunch stalk usually do not produce commercially acceptable fruit. Um, obviously, some of the cushion tissue that can be infected does make its way into boxes of fruit. The risk of pathogen movement can be minimised by not taking fruit from diseased plants, trimming as much of the cushion material as possible, and also through the use of post-harvest fungicides. Infected leaf and stem uh, trash pieces getting into fruit boxes is probably a greater risk. However, as TR4 tolerant cultivars become more widely deployed, a greater proportion of diseased plants will be producing marketable bunches compared with traditional Cavendish varieties. This increases the risk of pathogen movement through bunch stalks and infected cushion material in fruit boxes. Okay, moving on to the influence of uh, climate and soil factors. Weather events uh, such as prolonged wet or dry conditions, extremes in temperature and storm damage, and also soil conditions such as poor soil drainage and aeration, unfavourable chemical or physical conditions have a major influence on disease development. Weather affects the incidence and severity of fusarium wilt during infection, uh, during the systemic in, uh, infection of the xylem and also the development of wilt symptoms. Many workers over the years, including Fawcett in 1913, Risbeth in 1957, Stover in 1962, Simmons in 1966 and Epp in 1987, have noted an increase in disease incidence following heavy rainfall, and that conversely, disease symptoms appear more slowly during drought conditions. Rapid plant growth seems to favour disease development, symptom development that is. Similarly, plant growth is reduced during cooler winter temperatures and disease development may also progress more slowly, possibly due to reduced transpirational stress. Disease incidence has been reported to increase markedly following cyclonic weather events. Risbeth attributed this to the rapid production of many new roots which were highly susceptible to infection. He had previously shown that young roots of Gross Michel were more susceptible to infection than older roots. Flooding, waterlogging and mechanical damage to roots are also associated with extreme weather events like cyclones and may contribute to new infections. Uh, it's important to realise that the conditions which favour symptom expression and rapid disease development may not be the same as conditions which favour infection. Plant stresses such as drought and waterlogging may favour infection, as may cool temperatures. Natalie Moore found that a cultivar which is susceptible to subtropical race for infection sustained more damage due to winter chilling than a resistant cultivar. The resistant cultivar suffered less cold induced damage to photosynthetic mechanisms and was better able to maintain CO2 assimilation and leaf area in cold winter temperatures. Uh, I was interested to see in a recent presenta presentation by Dr. Damodaran from India that researchers there have been timing their management interventions according to predictable fluctuations in disease incidence related to rainfall and temperature in a subtropical environment. The application of biocontrol agents and organic amendments were applied 
um, at periods of lowest pathogen activity for maximum efficacy. Okay, moving on to soil factors. Stover indicated that disease is more serious in light textured soils compared with heavy clays. This is probably due to the effect of the sandy soil on the water relations of the host plant. But also Fusarium species are strongly aerobic and are favoured by soil water contents of less than field capacity. Soils suppressive to Fusarium wilt of banana, although not TR4, have been reported in Central and South America, Australia, Canary Islands and South Africa. Suppressive soils have sometimes been described as long life soils and conducive soils as short life. Although suppressive soils often have similar abiotic properties, such as higher pH, higher organic carbon content and clay texture, it's generally accepted that suppression is mainly through the impact of these properties on the saprophytic soil microflora, and disease suppression is probably mostly biological, biologically based. Soil microorganisms play a key role in suppressing soil-borne diseases, mainly via antagonism or competition. Um, although the disease is often more serious in light textured soils, poorly drained soils may also have a higher incidence of fusarium wilt. Saturated soils, which result in hypoxia, will enhance infection as low oxygen conditions damage roots, making them more susceptible to pathogen invasion and releasing more exudates to encourage spore germination. Damage due to waterlogging can occur quickly. Root death may begin within six hours, well before these conditions start to have a negative impact on the pathogen. Uh, reports on the role of soil chemical factors on disease development, especially fertiliser applications and soil pH, are often contradictory. This can be attributed in part to the difficulty in separating their effects on the host from those on the pathogen. Some of the more consistent findings include uh, low pH, ammonium forms of nitrogen, low potassium and low calcium can favour disease development. Recent work by Tony Patterson and Paul Dennis has shown that excessive nitrogen application, regardless of the nitrogen form, can have a negative impact on the soil microbiome, increase the dominance of FOC in the soil and leads to increased disease incidence. Because TR4 is such an aggressively pathogenic strain of the fungus, some of these soil factors may not be as important as they are for other strains of the pathogen, and they may have less impact on soil inoculum levels. Okay, moving on to spread of the pathogen and disease. As already mentioned, FOC is a soil-borne organism. Pathogen spread may be either passive or active. Active spread, that is the spread of an, an existing infection, depends on banana roots growing to the inoculum. Roots of adjacent healthy banana plants will grow into the root zone of diseased plants, thus accounting for mat to mat spread. With passive spread, that is spread to new areas, the inoculum is carried to the roots. And this may be via infected plant material, uh, crop debris or asymptomatic planting material, infested soil, which may contaminate vehicles, footwear, tools, or could be on planting material, animals, or even banana weevils and other insects and water movements, which includes floods and irrigation. Humans are the most significant dispersal agent. Um, in the picture on the top right there, you can see suckers ready for transplanting. And this type of planting material has likely been responsible for most movement of the disease over time. The planting material may be infected, but asymptomatic, or it may just be contaminated with infested soil. Irrigation from contaminated dams or rivers can rapidly spread the pathogen around a plantation especially when irrigation water from infested patches can drain into water storage and be recycled around a property. Spores sink in still water and eventually will be rendered non-viable through lack of oxygen. So floating water inlet systems can reduce the likelihood of spreading spores with irrigation water. But this is still a very risky practice in the presence of the disease. Uh, the bottom picture there shows just how effectively fusarium wilt pathogens can be spread with water. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, fusarium wilt of cotton being spread along rows with flood irrigation. Um, sporodokia, that is conidial spore masses, have been observe, observed forming on external surfaces of senescing banana leaves under glasshouse conditions by Miguel and also Nolene Warman and Liz Aitken at the University of Queensland. This raises the possibility of aerial or spread spread by rain splash, although this has not been reported in the field as far as I'm aware. 
Canidia are more fragile than clematis spores, so less likely to survive outside of the host, although Canidia can be modified in, into clematis spores. Um, a Panama disease epidemic will start with a single plant or a small cluster of plants. Foci may appear at random in the plantation. The pathogen will most likely arrive by man through infected or infested planting material or infested soil on footwear or vehicles. The spread from one plant to another then takes place essentially by overlapping roots of interconnected mats, whereas new centres of infection result from the passive dispersal of inoculum. Disease spread on larger farms may be more rapid than small farms in the same area if the larger farms are more mechanised and have a greater reliance on irrigation. Um, it's important to realise that the distribution of the pathogen is distinct from the distribution of the, the disease. Distribution of disease plants represents past spread and only shows where the pathogen has come into contact with a susceptible host. FOC can survive away from host plants where there's no evidence of disease as dormant clematis spores or in the roots of asymptomatic grass and weed hosts. The fungus can cause disease at very low initial inoculum levels. Since the banana plant remains in the soil for many years and the roots search through a large volume of soil, the probability that these roots will come into contact with inoculum present in the soil is high. Thus, limiting inoculum production is an important management goal. So looking at survival, TR4 is a soil-borne fungus that's well adapted to long-term survival in the soil. Uh, readily forms spores, which remain dormant in the remnants of decayed host tissue until stimulated to germinate by root exudates from bananas, alternative hosts, or pieces of fresh plant remains. Survival for 20 to 40 years has been reported by spores, even when bare fallowing is employed. Clematospores in decaying plant tissue will survive longer than those unprotected in the soil, but it's doubtful that such long periods of survival can be attributed to clematospores alone. Which brings up the topic of um, alternative hosts. It's long been known that FOC is able to parasitise the roots of plants without pathogenesis. This was demonstrated by Waite and Dunlap in Honduras as long ago as the early 1950s when they reported several alternative hosts. Recent work in Australia indicates that FOC is an efficient coloniser of alternative hosts when inoculum levels are high. Inoculation studies demonstrated that the pathogen is capable of surviving on a large number of common weeds and potential rotation crops from a diverse range of plant families, although there does seem to be some variation in species ability to host the fungus. In addition, Race 1, subtropical race 4 and tropical race 4 strains of the pathogen were isolated from many hosts sampled at naturally infested field sites around Australia. Recent work with GFP transformed isolates by Jay Anderson and Liz Aitken at the University of Queensland suggests that the colonisation by the fungus can be somewhat fish superficial in these alternative hosts. But the fungus does make its way into the crown and in some cases the stem tissue of some alternative hosts. Um, Burgess found that when alternative hosts of wheat crown rot were killed by herbicide, the fusarium proliferated and generated greater inoculum levels than if the weed had senesced naturally. Similar findings have been made recently at the University of Queensland for FOC on alternative hosts. So while these alternative hosts may be aiding the survival of the fungus, killing them with herbicide is probably not a good idea. In crop ground covers, may have many benefits such as improved water infiltration, reduced water stress, reduced erosion and enhanced soil microbial activity. Uh, Tony Patterson demonstrated a reduction in race one disease incidence when comparing a pinto peanut ground cover with bare soil. So the use of ground covers is a balancing act and their benefits may outweigh any disadvantage. They're probably not causing any significant increases in soil inoculum, but rather just allow the pathogen to survive without a banana host. Ideally, we will identify good non-host ground covers and rotation crops, but we haven't found any to date. Um, in a recent presentation from China by Dr. Zhu, he reported that they were trialling the legume Seratro or Macrotilium um, as a ground cover. And that was one of the species we identified as having a lower host potential. So it'll be interesting to see how it performs. 
Some infested farms have moved to a system where a tolerant variety, such as the Taiwanese Soma clones, are grown for just a few cycles before a rotation or fallow period. The one remaining commercial farm in the Northern Territory of Australia is taking such an approach, where bana bananas are grown for a couple of cycles and then alternated with pineapple rotations or a fallow. Similar approaches are being used in parts of the Philippines and elsewhere. So this ability to colonise alternative hosts is emerging as an important survival mechanism for FAC, and it helps to explain the decades-long persistence of the pathogen in the absence of bananas. Previous reports of extended survival in bare fallow situations uh, may not have been completely weed-free, and alternative hosts may have contributed to survival of the fungus. So these findings have implications for containment and management strategies, and as previously mentioned, they're also important when considering pathogen distribution. Um, alternative hosts determined through inoculation studies and field collection in Australia have recently been summarised um, in a guidebook that you can see there on that slide. Moving on to epidemic models. Um, an epidemiological approach is essential to understanding the outcomes of disease management protocols. Van der Plank in 1963 divided plant disease epidemics into two categories, simple interest or single cycle epidemics, SI, and compound continuous interest or multi-cycle epidemics, CCI. The difference between the two being whether or not inoculum from current disease can result in infection in the near future, that is new inoculum produced is added to the previous amount of inoculum. New inoculum is produced continuously within the crop after the initial infection. Thus, inoculum begets inoculum within a relatively short time and will continue to do so as long as environmental conditions favour rapid reproduction and dispersal of inoculum and subsequent infection of healthy plants. Epidemics of the CCI type have disease progress curves as shown. This model shows the progress of the epidemic over time. Fusarium wilt fits the CCI model, as do, as do some other soil-borne diseases, like many of those caused by Phytophthora, which have a short generation time and great reproductive capacity. This model allows us to assess the epidemiological potential of the disease. It also tells us when to apply various management strategies. The, epidem the epidemic will start slowly, the initial lag phase, which is A on the graph, and then accelerate rapidly in the exponential stage B, before a decline phase C, where very few plants are available for infection. An understanding of possible sources of initial inoculum, the means of pathogen dispersal and survival, and environmental conditions for infection and disease development is required. Early detection and impl implementation of strategies to keep the disease in the lag phase are essential. If this isn't done, the number of infected plants increases and the time between infection and symptom in expression is decreased as a function of increasing inoculum level. Now, a quick look at a couple of case studies. Uh, the progress of the TR4 epidemic in Taiwan was first documented by Su et al. in 1986. Commercial, commercial banana plantations in Taiwan, uh, sorry, commercial banana production in Taiwan involves many small farms, which are usually half a hectare to one hectare, rather than the extensive plantations managed by multinational company, companies in the more tropical regions of the world. Taiwan grew Cavendish for export to Japan. Uh, the first disease Cavendish plant in Taiwan was detected in 1967, but by 1976, there were half a million infected plants spread over 1,200 hectares. Over more than 30 years, the total area infested increased with some important changes in the rate of spread of the disease. Initially, at least on an absolute basis, the spread appeared slow but increased very rapidly in the mid-1970s. After this, there seems to have been a steady increase in the area infested. Rigid control measures introduced in 1970 were abandoned in 1973 because they were unpopular, difficult to apply, and had not prevented the spread of the disease as well as hoped. You can see that the epidemic curve fits the compound continuous interest model with an initial lag phase, followed by an exponential increase in diseased area and then somewhat of a decline, although in this case, the diseased area was still increasing steadily for the last couple of data points. Uh, the TR4 outbreak in Mozambique is an example of largely uncontrolled spread on large export farms. Movement of the pathogen in runoff water and flooding events, as well as some movement by people and animals, meant that the disease spread rapidly and very quickly transitioned from the lag phase into exponential growth. 
where huge numbers of plants became infected in a short period of time. You can see some data on this slide from Altus uh, showing the increase from only a handful of plants on some farms towards the end of 2013 to a total of over a million infected plants across the six farms in mid-2016. The growth curve for each farm shows rapid exponential growth, and if the epidemic had been allowed to run its course, the curves would have flattened out when few plants were available for infection. Okay, looking at the Queensland example now, where we've been hoping to keep the outbreak in the lag phase and avoid explosive exponential growth in infections. TR4 was detected in Queensland in the centre of Australia's main banana production area in 2015. Almost six years later, the, the disease has only been detected on five farms and less than 100 infected plants in total have been diagnosed and destroyed. The success of this control and containment strategy has been due to a combination of legislative powers, intensive surveillance, contact tracing, implementation of on increased on-farm biosecurity measures, accurate diagnostics through multiple assays, and close cooperation between industry, government regulators, researchers, and extension staff. The combined strategy is slowing the spread of TR4 and buying time for the industry. Uh, Rosie Godwin and Tony Patterson will be covering some of the aspects of the Australian, the Australian experience in more detail in later presentations in this series. Um, some of the control measures that we implement were implemented as best bets uh, based on prior knowledge of epidemiology and a rapid research response was conducted to fill knowledge gaps. A small team including Tun Nguyen in Northern Territory and Cathy Grice in North Queensland tested 32 commercial disinfectants to find the most effective agents for use in foot baths and for vehicle cleaning. Uh, a destruction protocol, protocol for newly detected disease foci was developed and tested through experimentation. So this is the um, use of urea for inoculum reduction. So I'll talk in this about I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. This is what Biosecurity Queensland do at new TR4 detection sites. Urea is applied at one kilogram per square metre as part of their destruction protocol. This recommendation was based on literature from the 1960s, uh, especially Secura, which reported that urea was effective at suppressing FOC in the soil. And it had already been used against subtropical race four in Queensland, along with the soil fumigant basimid. However, uh, in that case, it was soon realised that subtropical race four was already widespread. Uh, and had been present for some time, so its use was discontinued for subtropical race four. So the use of urea was a best bet strategy that was quickly rolled out when TR4 was detected in Queensland. This meant that some research was required as soon as possible to test its effectiveness. Uh, the previous research by Secura had suggested that the nitrite form uh, sorry, the nitrite from the decom decomposition of urea was the most effective um, chemical in the process at killing fusarium. One of my DAF colleagues, David East, conducted some container studies, which found that urea was indeed effective at killing FOC in the soil, but found that nitrite uh, actually wasn't effective. Rather, he found that the ammonia, which is the first step in the decomposition of urea, was responsible for the effect, and no FOC survived um, ammonia levels above 2,500 parts per million in the containers. Um, so then we moved on to a field trial in a race one infested site. We tested five treatments in small plots. Uh, the five treatments were urea covered with plastic, uh, urea which was spread and then watered into the ground and covered with plastic, uh, urea plus the basement fumigant covered with plastic, plastic only and an untreated uh, bear control. And here, here are some of the results. Um, after 15 days, the Fusarium oxysporum population was reduced by around 98% in the five to 15 centimetre depth range in the soil. Uh, that was for all of the urea treatments. And there was no extra benefit in adding the soil fumigant basement. So on the graph there, the, uh, the two bars on the left where there is still a very high population of Fusarium oxysporum, that's the untreated and the plastic only plot plots and the other three bars where there's very low population for the three different treatments that involved urea. Um, nitrite, oh sorry, ammonia levels average more than 2,000 parts per million in all urea plots, with some plots being much higher. Uh, if you remember, 2,500 parts per million was the critical level that David found that uh, killed all of the FOC. 
Nitrite was only detected at low levels in a few of the plots, and this seems to confirm David's result from the container study that ammonia is likely to be responsible for the effect. Such high rates, high rates of urea are not environmentally acceptable for use on a large scale. However, um, yeah, for, in, for established infestations, but they can be useful for new infection hotspots that are caught early. One downside of such treatment is that it will form a biological vacuum where most microorganisms are killed off, not just the fusarium. So further research is required to assess recolonization from adjacent soil or from greater depth. The treatment seems to be working quite well to stop active spread from hotspots, as subsequent detections on infested properties are usually new foci in random locations from previous spread rather than extensions of the existing hotspots. Um, Biosecurity Queensland also bag the TR4 infected plant material and add urea as part of their destruction strategy. So we ran an experiment in the glasshouse, again with race one, to test its effectiveness. We added 200 grams of urea to 50 litre bags, which contained three large pseudo stem pieces. We then measured FOC survival at different depths inside those stem sections, as well as the concentration of ammonia in the bags. Uh, in the picture there, you can see the bag plant material uh, with and without urea. Okay, and here are the stem pieces removed from the bags after four weeks. On the left, you can see the stems from untreated bags and an example of the associated isolation plates uh, for isolations taken from different depths inside the stem pieces at the end of the experiment. And on the right are the stems from a urea treated bag. Uh, you can see there's been much more breakdown of the stem material and some of the isolation plates, um, again, uh, with isolations done from different depths inside the stem pieces. There's much less growth in this case. Um, at the end of the experiment, after four weeks, FOC survival was reduced by about 90% in the urea treated bags compared with the untreated. Ammonia concentrations were close to the 2000 parts per million mark. So with longer exposure, there should be little pathogen survival. Biosecurity Queensland actually leaves the bag material uh, in the field indefinitely. Uh, urease, which is the enzyme required to catalyse the hydrolysis of urea to produce the ammonia, uh, is actually produced by FOC and it's also present in parts of the banana plant. Um, another strategy that might be tried in a similar vein uh, to the use of urea on infested plant material um, might be the use of fungicides uh, injected into infected pseudostems to reduce fungal sporulation and so inoculum load. So that's another uh, strategy worthy of further investigation for possible use in destruction strategies for new detections of TR4. Okay, so just in conclusion, although TR4 prob can probably not be stopped, strategies to control and contain the disease based on an understanding of epidemiology in combination with intensive surveillance and rapid di diagnostics can help to keep the disease in the lag phase and so avoid the explosive growth phase of an epidemic. Uh, this has been the major focus of TR4 management in Queensland. Uh, such an approach will help to buy time until new sources of resistance and successful integrated management strategies can be widely deployed to ensure production in the presence of TR4. Okay, thank you very much.